there, my name is Nina and I'm a summer student at the Rody House Museum this year. So for the month of July, Rody House is celebrating Historic Places Month. Every Wednesday we're going to be uploading a short little video or vignette that has something to do with my project for the summer. I'm here in the Rody House kitchen, which is possibly one of the most authentic rooms in the house, and I'm doing research on domestic work in the Victorian and early Edwardian periods. So today I'm going to be showing you a little bit about how laundry was done in this time. Now, laundry was much more labor intensive back in the day than it was now. The woman of the house would have gotten up at five or six in the morning to start doing laundry and it would have taken the entire day. So we're not completely accurate here because it's a Wednesday and laundry would traditionally have been done on a Monday. And the reason for that is because on Sunday, families would have a great big meal. So on Monday, you could eat cold leftovers and you wouldn't have to take a bunch of time off by cooking. So to start doing the laundry, we're going to pretend it's about five in the morning and I'm about to get started on my day. The first thing I'm going to do here is stoke a fire in this lovely wood burning oven. And I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to heat up a kettle with hot water, one of these copper kettles here. And then I'm going to go and pour it into this tub. I would actually have more than one tub, one for the whites and one for the colors. You would wash them separately and we'll get into that in a little bit. Just let me put my kettle back quickly. So the, I have a few pieces here. These would go in here and this, I would put this back on the sink and I would let it boil. And then while that would happen, while the colored laundry was soaking, in warm water and while the white laundry was boiling on the stovetop, I would get to take a break and make breakfast. For the whole family that is, it's not really much of a break. So after these have been separated, after they're boiling, and after we're done having breakfast, I have the delightful task of starting to scrub all of the laundry. Now to do that, I'm going to take this washboard which has an uneven surface that you can rub the laundry against to get rid of the worst of the dirt. And I'm going to take this little device, it's called a soap rattler. It's a little metal wire that's got some soap inside. Get that and get my bin and work up a bunch of suds with the washboard. Um, once I've got it nice and sudsy, I'm going to keep my little rattler here and then I'm going to be taking the laundry one piece at a time and rubbing it against the washboard until it's nice and foamy and until all the dirt is coming off. So this was really labor intensive. This is quite tiring and would have taken a large portion of your day, especially if you had a big family like the roadies did and had a lot of laundry. <laughs> is that a good spot? So once you've done soaping all of your laundry, you're going to do the rinsing process. Now this is another pretty long, pretty intense process. You're going to be switching between having your laundry in a bin here full of water with no soap and running it through this little machine here. This is called a mangler. It's a bit similar, it's kind of the closest thing that the roadies would have had to a dryer. Now the way it works is you have these two rolls here and you have a little handle right here and you feed your laundry through these two pieces of the mangler by turning this handle. Now this isn't going to wring all of the water out in one go, but it will get the worst of it done. And because by the first round of going through the mangler, the laundry wasn't necessarily perfectly rinsed, you would alternate between running something through the mangler, rinsing it, and running it through until the laundry was free of soap, free of dirt, and not completely dry, but not dripping dry. Then, the last step, especially for white laundry, was to add bluing, which is this funky little substance. It's a bit, all we, they would use it almost the way that we use bleach nowadays to make your white laundry look as pristine and clean as possible. It's this little bottle here and it has this, you can still see there's some of it in there, this very intense blue dye. And you would only put one little drop in the rinse water and that would brighten and make your laundry nice and sparkly clean. <laughs> so it comes in this liquid form. You can, we also have a couple of different types of bluing here. There's this stuff that is bluing on a brush, 
the idea is that you dip the brush into the basin instead of having to go through the bottle. And there's also, this one would, would have been quite common, this little Reckitt's brand box of bluing, which inside, I'm not gonna open it because I don't wanna get my gloves all blue. There's a tiny little cloth bag that has solid form bluing, which is still quite potent to this day, which I think is honestly pretty cool. So once you've done the bluing and the rinsing process, you are going to be hanging the laundry out to dry. And that would mostly be done outside or in poor weather. You would go and have a laundry rack set up in your kitchen. This one here, we have sock forms. These, are, these would have been hand knit socks and they're put over these wooden stretchers so that they don't lose their shape when they dry. Now, Matilda Rohde had a very large collection of lace. She was quite fond of lace. And in order to dry lace properly, you would have to stretch it often and pinning it in place to make sure that it held its shape. And she would stretch out her lace and put it in the sunroom on the third floor of the roadie house in the little turret they have up there. It's really quite a sweet little room. Sorry. So you've washed your laundry, you've rinsed your laundry, you've hung it all up to dry. Once your laundry has been all hung up and it's been dried, it's going to be folded or set aside for ironing, which is the sort of chore of the day for Tuesday. There are some things in the house that can't necessarily go through this process, things that we might have dry clean today, things like carpets, which when they needed cleaning would have been hung out to dry probably in the backyard and then flacked repeatedly, technical term, with this woven rattan carpet beater until all of the dust and grime had gotten out because you couldn't wash your carpets. Partly because of what they were made of, partly because if you're doing all of this by hand, a wet carpet is honestly going to be way too heavy to lift and very, very awkward to put through the mangler. Pardon that. Now, one thing you might have noticed over the course of this little tutorial is that the sink is very, very low down. Now, most Victorian sinks would not have been this close to the ground, but this is actually the original sink that was put in the home in 1893. Um, the lady of the house, Matilda Rohde, was very petite. She stood between four foot eight and four foot 11. So the sink was custom built so that she could comfortably do all of her laundry without having to stand on tiptoe or anything uncomfortable. Now, after the Rohde family moved out of this house in 1925, it became a boarding home. And there's stories about one of the boarders, the son of the gentleman who ran the place, who was very, very tall, over six feet, complaining and hating having to do laundry in here because he had to bend so far down. Just think that's a little fun detail. Now, this would have taken the whole day and this might feel a little bit daunting to you modern viewers, but the thing is Victorian families didn't own as much clothing as we do nowadays. We own, we modern folks own a lot of clothing. They also had a couple of little tips and tricks so that they could build up their laundry without running out of things to wear. I've got right here this men's shirt, which has a separate collar. You could detach the collar and wash it and it was a lot smaller and you could wear the shirt a few times before it got dirty. Victorians would also have worn a lot of undergarments that could be changed out regularly, but then have nicer, perhaps thicker woolen pieces of outerwear that wouldn't need to be worn as often. You could also, if something just had a tiny little stain, let's pretend I have just a tiny little stain on this dress, but I don't want to wash it, wash the whole thing, I mean, you could just put a tiny bit of bluing on it to get the stain out or just touch it up with a little bit of soap without having to run the whole thing through the mangler over and over again. Because that, honestly, would be very tedious and wash day is enough work as is. <laughs> because wash day is so much work, most middle class families would have had at least once, one or two servants to help them out. So Matilda Rohde would have done most of the laundry, but she did have a Chinese gentleman who worked for her. He was known as a day boy. He would come in mostly the help of cooking, but we have some records that also talk about him helping out with the laundry just to make it go by smoother. Um, now, af after World War I, we saw a lot of a shift where less and less people could afford to keep servants, 
and women found themselves having to do all the household management by themselves. But luckily, they weren't alone. There's some fun books in the Rody collection, like this one, this household manual from 1922, which gives you helpful advice on how to manage laundry if you haven't necessarily been doing it all yourself, or it introduces you to new tips and tricks to make the laundry process easier. There's a fun little chapter in here that's called Some Laundry Secrets, and it's all useful tips and tricks for your laundry. It has things like a list of how to wash colored fabrics and how to keep their color brighter, sort of alternatives to bluing except for colored fabrics instead of white. McClary's here advises you to add to one gallon of water half a cup of mild vinegar if you're washing blue clothing. If you're washing pink, black, or brown clothes, instead of the vinegar, you should add two whole cups of salt. And perhaps most interestingly, if you're washing lavender fabric, which I'm, I'm assuming must have been more common back then than it is now, you would add either a tablespoon of sugar or a tablespoon of lead to your washing water to keep that color nice and perfect and lavendery. See through cookbooks, these are a very exciting resource. You can really trace the way that domestic life changed between the 1890s and the 1920s because it did change quite dramatically. I have here an earlier cookbook. This is Mrs. Black's Household Cookery and Laundry Work, which is in much poorer condition, unfortunately, but that's because it is that much older. It's from 1886. And instead of giving large amounts of advice on how to do the laundry yourself, it has a short chapter on washing, only a few pages long with none of the neat little tips that we see in McClary's. And then it has a whole chapter called Domestic Economy, which largely teaches you how to boss your servants around.